Hey, you guys. You know, it's a lot of fun to look out here and uh, see so many people you love. <laughs> Praise God. It just is. I mean, it's a, it's a real blessing and a privilege. And uh, anyway, praise God. Yeah, we're going to take up the offering in a minute and, uh, and get ready for that. Because uh, I just was thinking while I was sitting there how important it is uh, to get free in our finances. I mean, to just be free. If you can get free in your finances, you can be really dangerous. <laughs> Uh, I was in a meeting a few years ago, and um, the Lord gave me a word and said that He was going to start a work that night for anybody that wanted us wanted to do it. That He would start setting us free from the Egyptian system. You know that He would start setting us free. And uh, Moses came. He came. He said, "I've come to set you free from Egyptian bondage." Right. I've come here. God has sent me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead you out of bondage to Egypt. And I just want to tell you, part of His plan for the end times is to set us free from the Egyptian system. And we can participate in that. It's a whole other economy. Philippians 4.15, Paul said, um, I have, uh, he said to the Philippian church, he said, when I first set out from Macedonia, Nobody participated in giving and receiving with me except you. He was t and there's a whole other economy based on giving and receiving. I don't want to take up a lot of time, but I'll just give you a quick tip. A couple of weeks ago, uh, my wife and I were going through the drive through at the bank, and I just said, Honey, we need to get $40 extra out. I don't know, I don't know what it's for yet, but the Lord wants us to get $40 out. And I didn't know who it was for. I didn't know what it was for. But I stuck it in my pocket, and it was there for a couple of days. And I just, I was just waiting. I was just waiting. And then I, I ran into a young man who was working, but he was walking uh, like three miles one way to work and back because he didn't have gas money. And I, was, I just said, well, I know, <laughs> I know what this 40 bucks is for. And I was able to bless him. There's a whole other economy based on giving and receiving that the Lord wants us to step into. No pressure. No stress. If you're not supposed to give this morning, don't give. But be free in your finances. Be free in your money. God wants us to be free in that. Anyway, um, praise God. Praise God. So, Lord, we set our... Set our hearts free, Lord, this morning to be able to give and receive, to participate with you in giving. And just can you just block out every TV preacher you ever heard or every offering sermon you ever heard? Just, just kind of push it to the side for a minute and just say, I'm here, Lord. I'm here. Set me free in my finances. I mean... It'll go a long way towards setting you free in your whole life. Really. Anyway. God's been, God is doing something in our time. And uh, you ever have an assignment? Maybe it was by the Lord. Maybe it was in the natural. But the Lord gives you an assignment. And you look at it and you go, there is no way I can do this. You ever have somebody do that to you? Hey, hey, James, we need you to do X, Y, and Z. You say, I don't have any business doing anything like that. I might as well do brain surgery right now this morning as do what, you know, do the... I mean, has anybody ever been there? You just feel overwhelmed? Well, we're facing the end times where it could be really easy to be overwhelmed. We need to be set free in our finances. We need to be set free in other things. But I know that... Um, I won't name any names, but several years ago I was working for uh, a pretty big ministry. And um, the, the guy who was the head of the ministry, I, I, used to, I, tra I got to travel with him some. And one time we were flying down to Atlanta to, uh, uh, for a, some kind of TV show that he had to be on. And uh, on the way back, 
he just, he was flying the plane anyway. So on the way back, he said, hey, James, come sit up here with me. Uh, let's talk for a little bit. So I went up there and I sat with him. And then all of a sudden, the Lord started speaking to him. Okay, now he's flying a plane. And the Lord started speaking to him. And so he whipped out his notebook and he whipped out his pen and he starts writing stuff down. And the plane's just going, okay? And so he looks over at me and he said, hey, James, grab that wheel in front of you. Is there another James in this cockpit? You know? I'm honestly, that's what he, he said. James, grab that wheel. And this is honestly what he said. He said, uh, you see this gauge right here? Keep that line in between that one and that one. And you see this one? Keep that line in between this one and this one. And then he just... And I'm like, you know, okay. And then uh, uh, about 10 minutes later, he looked up and he said, did you know you're in a banking turn? And I went, oh, no, no. So I did this one went back. I'm totally serious. Now, I really had as much business flying a plane as I did brain surgery. I really did. And... um. But I want to tell you, God is calling each one of us to do things that are beyond ourselves. God is calling you to participate in an end time harvest that is beyond you. You don't have it in you, in and of yourself, to do it. Can you just receive that for a minute? We don't have the finances. We don't have the know-how. I don't have the ability. Praise God. The government is on His shoulders. He's got a whole other government. And He's carrying it on His shoulders. And He wants us to participate. He wants us to participate. Several years ago when I was working for Morningstar, I got to do an interview with Reinhard Bonnke. And it really, it really blessed me. And uh, he, he shared some real special things. But it's, a, it's an old article in the Morning Star Journal. Uh, and, uh, but it was, it was fun. It was at a time when the, uh, his ministry was just at the height. I mean, he was going from one crusade to another where one crusade would have 1.1 million. The next one would have 1.4 million. He was having like... 300 and 400,000 people at a time get baptized in the Holy Spirit. He would have, you know, I mean, he would have a several day crusade. I mean, when I say 1.4 million, I mean in one meeting. I mean in one meeting, okay? And over the course of a four or five day crusade, they would actually have over a million decision cards that people had filled out giving their lives to Jesus. I mean, this was a powerful thing. And uh, so anyway, I got to interview him and and write this uh, article and everything and listen to some of his testimonies. And you know, anytime the Lord calls you to do something, it's going to be really easy, smooth sailing, nothing's going to oppose you. Right? Is that... Okay. I'm sorry, Lord. You know, i got to be careful. Revelation 21.8 says liars go to hell. So Uh, I'm sorry for lying to you um you know yeah everybody knows it already right well anyway um josh who was here last weekend had i didn't know this and we didn't know this but reinhardt Bonke just finished his last crusade over in africa he's retiring 75 million people have come to the Lord in His crusades. (laughs) Almost all of them black Africans, right? Vast, vast majority, 98, 99, whatever percent, are black Africans. Did you know that when he first, he he told us this, when he first went to Africa, he went there as part uh, part of a, a church organization. He went to South Africa And they forbade him to preach to black people or to preach in mixed meetings. Did y'all know that? They forbade him to preach in mixed meetings. And he just just said it was like he was 
slugging through the mud that first year, going nowhere, and he felt miserable, and he knew it was wrong. He had one of the reasons he ended up, or, you know, he pointed his direction toward Africa. When he was a little boy, there was a woman in his church. His father was a pastor in Germany. There was a woman in the church that had a vision of him that she shared with the congregation, said, I saw Reinhardt standing and speaking to just a multitude of black faces. Okay? That's part of the way he knew he understood his call to Africa, right? So anyway, he had to slog through the mud for a while, but he finally he said to that denomination, you know, when you break with a denomination, a lot of times there's all kinds of support that gets cut off. You know, financial support and other things that just totally get cut off. But he finally said this. He said, he was talking about the black South Africans. He said, if this gospel does not make him and me brothers, then I don't want to preach this gospel anymore. And he went off on his own. And uh, he began having a vision of Africa set on fire. Uh, from the, have, Has anybody else here ever ever been in one of his meetings? Y'all ever been in one? Of, I mean, it's, it was, it's just phenomenal. Anyway, so he said um, he started having this vision of Africa on fire for the Lord, and then he said he wrote he wrote a song. He said the Lord gave him a song to sing. Now this is you know I don't know maybe he was in a a uh, church with 11 people in it at this time. I don't know. You know, you don't know. Somebody's just starting off. But the Lord gives him a song. Do y'all remember? Are we going to believe God? Are we going to believe Jesus, the words of Jesus? Matthew 7, Jesus said, Ask, and you shall receive. Ask. This is bigger than us. The, the harvest is bigger than us. But the Lord has an answer. Ask, and I'll give it to you. John chapter 14. Ask anything in my name, and I'll do it. Did Jesus really mean that? Did He really mean that? He said, Matthew 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. For everyone who asks, receives. Everyone who asks, receives. Are you willing to believe Jesus? That, it, that word there in Greek is in the present tense. I bet Pastor David knows that. In the present tense in Greek, it means ongoing repetitive action. It means you ask and you ask and you ask. And a week later, you ask. You ask. But Jesus said, ask and keep on asking. Because everyone who asks and keeps on asking, it will be done for them. So, here we are 38 years later or whatever it is. 75 million souls in Africa come to the Lord Jesus. But here's the song that the Lord gave him. If you believe and I believe and we together pray, the Holy Spirit will come down and Africa will be saved. And Africa will be saved. And Africa will be saved. The Holy Spirit will come down and Africa will be saved. So, Reinhard Bonnke started going around Africa, preaching in these meetings and singing this song. And he kept singing it, and he kept singing it. And he would look people in the face and say, If you believe, and I believe, and we together pray, the Holy Spirit will come down. And Africa will be saved. Africa will be saved. That was 
His message. I see Africa ablaze with the Gospel. And Africa will be saved. And um, I was in one of his meetings where he led that song. <laughs> I don't know if you... Have you ever... I mean, it's, it's a powerful thing. It was... It, oh, man. And you know, here it is 38 years later. Africa is being saved. Africa is quickly becoming the center of world Christianity. Did y'all know that? Africa is becoming the center of world Christianity. Not only because of the number of people getting saved, there's other ministries we know in Mozambique and other places, right, that are participating in this, but also it's one of the last places on the earth where people actually believe in having lots of children. So there is a principle of natural church growth. Do you know what a statement of faith that is in our day and time? To have children, to have four children, five children, six children. You're saying, I believe in the future. I believe in the future the Lord has for me. Well, anyway, I want to I ask you something. Can we believe? Because I will tell you this, in my heart... Standing here, I know this. If you believe, and I believe, and we together pray, I don't care what it looks like right now, the Holy Spirit will come down, and America will be saved. 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 Can we speak that to each other? Can we say, America will be saved, Dylan. Did you know America's going to be saved? You know? In spite of all the witchcraft, all the Hollywood, this and that, all the deep state politics or whatever you want to name out, America's going to be saved. I don't know what has to happen between here and there, but I know America will be saved. America is going to be saved. America will be saved. And I want to sing that. Can we sing that in faith? Will you believe Jesus with me? If you believe and I believe and we together pray, the Holy Spirit will come down. America will be saved. America will be saved. America will be saved. The Holy Spirit will come down. America will be saved. If you believe and I believe and we together pray, the Holy Spirit will come down. America will be saved. America will be saved. America will be saved. The Holy Spirit will come down. America will be saved. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. America will be saved. America will be saved. America will be saved. Thank you, Jesus. Well, last weekend I thought it was very special to have Josh Monday. Monday night was very special. A very small gathering. You don't have to be big. You just got to be hungry. The power of God was present. How many of you were touched in some way in those meetings last weekend? You, you were encouraged. You were touched. You know, God is doing some incredible things. He's, I think in Monday night He talked about the um, characteristics of the last day church. And we've talked about things like that. And, uh, but one of the things I wanted to reemphasize, he, he challenged us to set a soul goal. A soul goal. And I remember when I was in Mississippi... We, uh, I went into a series, a time of fasting that God called me to. But every day at noon, we would pray through the phone book in Columbia, Mississippi. What's the name of that county? Walthall County, right? I don't know. Maybe Walthall was near. But it was one of those counties. So anyway, we're praying through the phone book. The Johnsons, the Jareds, you know, all you were just going through. And we prayed. And then we were getting ready for these meetings. And I was, on a Saturday night, I was walking, praying, asking the Lord. I said, well, God, these meetings that are coming up, you know, it was still about a month away. How many souls are we going to, should we expect? And so the thought came, 50. 
And I said, God, we pray for 50 souls. And the Lord rebuked me. He said, what do you mean? 50. Is that the kind of God you serve? 50 souls? I said, well, God, there's only 150 people in the church. That'd be a major increase. You know what I mean? And uh, he said, you asked me for a thousand. And you announce it tomorrow in church. I said, God, if I do that, they'll think I'm crazy. But anyway, I did it anyway. They didn't think I was crazy. They had faith. Faith was on their faces. So we got ready. We prepared for a thousand. We didn't know what was going to happen. And, you know, to make a long story short, we had over 1,200 people come to Jesus over three weeks. And it was a great... They, they wrote about it in Charisma. And it was a move of the Spirit. And we want to be... You know, you know who the wise are? Who are the wise, according to Proverbs? He that wins souls is wise. How many of you are wise? How many of you are going to get wise? We, we need to stir that up in us, that evangelism. And, uh, you know, at the end of the age, you want to be among the wise. You remember that apocalyptic book, the book of Daniel? It says, those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament. And though they are those who turn many to righteousness. So we want to be among the wise. So I was just wanting to challenge you in that. I don't know if we'll put it up here, but we need to make it known. You know, God does something when you take a step of faith and you set a goal. You have some substance in your prayer. Like James was challenging us, ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be open. So you ask God, email us, tell us what you hear so that we can cry out to God for that many souls. There's a man, he's not here anymore, but his bones are over there at the end of this property who God showed him a billion soul harvest. We have a major part of that. You know, it's part of our inheritance. Bob did not see that come to pass, but Bob from the great cloud of witnesses is going to see it come to pass. This is one of the places. In fact, he goes to church here. I know that because he's in that great cloud of witnesses. He doesn't go to Fort Mill. It takes too long. He goes to this church. I'm telling you. No, I know it's way beyond my pay grid on that, the great cloud of witnesses. But I believe, I've often, I don't see him in the natural, but I know there's a great cloud of witnesses here. And so, Lord, do it. Give us the sole goal. Lord, we die to our 50, we die to our 1,000. Show us what's in your heart. Lord, show us something that is absolutely impossible to do without you. But more than possible when you are doing it through us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Somebody reminded me this week, they said, what was it? Without God, we can't. Without us, God won't. Not that God can't. He can do whatever. But He chooses to use you and me. He's going to use us in this hour in an incredible, outpouring, shaking. America's got to be shaken. You know that. Maybe next week. I don't know. But I, I was making notes out of Hebrews. Just I saw, man, just a bunch of... Like, like, one, two, three, four, five, six, like 17 ways in which you are to live during the great shaking. If the Lord allows next week, I'll share that. So you'll be on pins and needles. No. No, you're going to be on pins and needles in this day. Everything that can be shaken is going to be shaken. Everything. Governments, families. So that all that man made that without God is going to slip away. No, it actually burn up. Is that anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. So go with me, if you would, to Acts chapter 27. Acts 27. Thank you, God, for being with us. I always, when I get ready to preach, I, I always say, God, couldn't somebody else do this? That's just the way I, I, I am. I, you know, I'm not looking for anything. I'm just, I just, but I yield to Him. And He always tells me, you know, I've chosen you. Just get up and do it. Don't worry about it. You know what I mean? So I'm thanking Him. You know, after you've been preaching for 35 plus years, 36 years, you say, God, you know, there might be a come a time like Reinhardt. We might step down from this. And I, I'm, I'm not anywhere the age of Reinhardt, okay? He's like 100 years older than me. Well, not that much. But, no. but anyway, you know, there does come a time. And 
So I'm just every grateful. I just told Shirley, I'm so thankful I get to preach. Isn't that amazing? You actually get to preach the gospel, the word of God. This is the most incredible. You can have the presidency. You can have the governorship. You can have the CEO of Apple. I would rather be a preacher. It is the highest calling in my book on the face of the earth. An ambassador. But you have that calling. In fact, let me rephrase that. Not so much being a preacher. Being a son of God is the highest calling. A son or a daughter of the living God, the creator of the ends of the earth. That's a major calling. And um, so we are grateful. Well, let's look. Acts 27. I want to read. And then we're going to look at some things and then pray and um, ask God to impart. We need some miracles this morning. There are people that need breakthroughs. Anybody need breakthroughs? So we're going to pray around the altar, whoever wants to. I know I spoke with some man and there's a, a physical need. There are others. We, we're going to see. God is, we got to just keep pressing in. Keep believing God. I'd rather believe. You know what I mean? I'd rather believe. I remember, like I, I've shared this before, but it came back to my memory. It's okay to, to repeat. Shirley read me a scripture this morning where Paul said, I keep bringing these things to your memory. Jesus used repetition. What's that? To keep you safe. Exactly right. And I, I just remember the night when I, I told God when I was praying for a wife. I said, God, I've been praying a million. I've been praying and praying and praying for a wife. Even if I never see it, I'm going to thank you for answering my prayer. When I get to glory, I'm going to say, thank you, God. You heard every one of my prayers. I remember that. I got free from a lot of stuff. Well, at least for that night. And then I went back praying. You know, you got to use, you're in a battle. How many of you know that? You get temporary victories and then the, you, then you have to go back and win again and again and again and again and again. Okay. Acts 27, look in verse 6. There a centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing to Italy and he put us on board. And when we had sailed slowly many days and arrived with difficulty, verse 8, passing it with difficulty, verse 9, Now, when much time had been spent and sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already over, saying, Men, I perceive that this voyage will end with disaster and much loss, but only of the cargo and the ship, but also our lives. Nevertheless, the centurion was more persuaded by the helmsman than he was by the things spoken by Paul. And because the harbor was not suitable to winter, The majority advises us to set on sail. Keep going. Verse 13, when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their desire, putting out to sea, they sailed close to Crete. But not long after, a tempestuous head wind arose called Eurocladon. So when the ship was caught and could not head into the wind, we let her drive. And running under the shelter of the island called Clauda, We secured the skiff with difficulty. Now, verse 20. Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days and no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved was finally given up. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst. Men, you should have listened to me. (laughs) You know, that's a good way to put it. You should have listened to me. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there should be, or stood by me this night, an angel of God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you and all those who sail with you. Therefore, take heart, for I believe, God, that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. So, Lord, we pray you would open our heart to the Word. Give us understanding. Give us revelation. Lord, let me impart it like you showed it to me. God, we pray. Lord, we want to see Jesus. We want to hear your word. Thank you that your word will never return void. It will accomplish your purpose. So we are just really honored that we get to hear. And Lord, we want to be doers and not just hearers. So come, Holy Spirit. Lord, this is the hour. We're believing it. We're we're staking our claim that America will experience another great spiritual awakening. We're just one of many, but we're one place that believes that, Lord. So we thank you. God, touch people today. 
touch people, do things that are impossible with us, but are possible with you. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Okay, so let's just review what's happening. We're going to look at some things. Paul had begun his voyage to Rome to appear before Caesar. And he is going in what was a part of God's perfect will for his life. How many of you know that? It was God's will. And all of a sudden, in the midst, and I think James referred to this this morning, in the midst of his journey to Rome and in the midst of the will of God, a great storm arises. Why do storms have to arise? In fact, if you look in verse 13 and verse 14, it said there was first a south wind that blew softly, and then things really began to heat up, and it changed from a little gentle breeze to a Cat 5 storm it's called Eurocladon. Eurocladon. It's a funny name, but anyway, it's a bad storm. And the storm, the waves began to rose, and they were heading right into it. This week, I looked up on my, as I'm putting all this together, I remembered this book that someone gave me back in 1992. Your sister gave it to me, Shirley. And it's Storm Warning by Billy Graham. He's rather young back in those days. But you, how many of you remember that? It was a prophetic statement in 1992. It's really a prophetic statement for today. And talks about the political storms that are on the horizon, financial storms that are still looming. You know, they hadn't gone away anywhere. You know, the dollar is still in, in great jeopardy. In fact, it's just a piece of paper. Racial, ethnic storms. Jesus told, all these, told us that these things were coming. Natural disasters, earthquakes, plagues. Families, there are families that are facing storms that are unprecedented in this hour. I'm telling you, I know of one in particular. They're facing things that it's just not right. It's not even possible. But God wants to do something that's unprecedented in this hour. He wants to rise up with unprecedented power in the midst of His people. Now, storms are not new phenomena. They've always been around, right? How many of you have ever been caught up in a storm that you hadn't planned on getting into? You know, it just happened. It came out of the blue. You remember that time we were walking with our kids when we lived in West Virginia? Were they walking? Josh was walking. Emily wasn't. She was strolling. She wasn't. Where was she? Inside of you. Oh, that's where she was. She wasn't strolling. She was strolling inside of you. But I remember we went up. There was an airport. It's a small airport. In, in West Virginia, and that where we live, believe me, is a small airport. Once a year, a plane, no, no, I don't know when. But we went up, and I, I would go up there and pray, you know, because it was a great place to pray. You weren't going to, huh? You could walk, yeah. It was one very close to our house, on top of a mountain. We were up there walking. What? We drove up there, but still, we went down to the end of the driveway. I mean, the runway. Don't mess my story up. Just help me tell it right. <laughs> You know, so we're down at the end of the runway and all of a sudden we hear crack the trees cracking. We could see the storm out of the blues coming. So me and Shirley and Josh and Emily, I was carrying Josh and you and you were carrying Emily. She was inside of you. So we're running for our lives. We felt like we're running for our lives. We were. Yeah, it was like that one. But it was like it just caught us without warning. And, and you know, we, but we made it. You can see we're here today, so we made it. But in other words, what I'm saying is storms, when you face storms, that does not mean you're outside of the will of God. You're probably right in the middle of the will of God. You remember Joseph. He's a great example. This woman who had an agenda falsely accused him of something that he had no, he did not do. I wonder if any of that kind of stuff happens today. He's called the accuser of the brethren. Now, some of it is being exposed. God's just, you remember Ezekiel? He had this vision and he saw a hole in the wall. He saw, remember that? And he goes up to the hole. He's looking in the hole and the Lord says, dig in the wall or break away. And he, he sees a door and he goes in the door. He, God shows him the abominations that are going on in his house. And, it's an, and they don't think God sees. I'm telling you, God sees. That's a powerful story. 
You know, and so God is uncovering everything that's hidden. He's going to reveal it. He's going to expose it. At the same time, the enemy, the accuser of the brethren is running rampant. It's one of the end of the age battles that we get to fight. This is it. The accuser of the brethren. You better know how. He's coming to you. He's coming to divide, destroy the accuser of the brethren. We overcome by the blood, by the word. And we love not our life unto death. But, you know, regarding Joseph, what God, what the devil meant for evil... God meant for good, didn't He? So, if we get falsely accused, just stand on the promise. Listen, devil, what are you trying to do to destroy me? I believe God will redeem it and many people, people will be saved because I'm going through this garbage. That I didn't want to go through, but I'm going through it. Some storms you don't have a choice. So anyway, we're going to see what happens in this. So first of all, in verse 7 through verse 8... And then you can see down in verse 16, they were sailing with great difficulty. Say difficulty. That's what it says. It says in verse 7, they had sailed many days, slowly, many days, and they arrived with difficulty. Some storms, and in fact, they couldn't even proceed because the difficulty, it knocked them off course. Difficulty. We're going to face difficulties in this hour. If you think you've already faced the greatest difficulties, hang on. Stuff's going to get interesting. But we're made for this moment. Greater is He that's in us. Either you will know that or you won't know that. But if you know that, you will find the greater is He that's in you than He that's in this world. That Scripture was given to those who would stand before the Antichrist. The Antichrist is alive and well. If he's not, the spirit of Antichrist is alive and well. We are facing battles that were reserved for these moments. Gates have been opened of darkness, reserved for these days. But guess what? That means you and I have been reserved for these days too. We've been chosen for these days, for these times, to stand against wickedness, but Reflect the glory of God. Light is greater than darkness. But there are going to be difficulties. You remember, you say, well, I'm still not convinced of that. Jesus said, enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way to life. And there are few who find it. You know why there are few that find the narrow way? Because it's difficult. And many people are not willing to pay the price. They're not, they try to run from the difficulties. Run. Now there's a time to get out of the storm. There's a time to run right into the midst of it. And declare that Jesus reigns in that storm. His reign is greater than whatever reign you're going to face. But we all have testimonies. I guarantee if we pass the mic around, people would tell us, and on the web as well, people would say, man, you don't know the storms I've already faced. You you just don't know. If If he was not the anchor of my soul, I'd been sunk a long time ago. But they found that God was faithful. We all have those testimonies, those stories. Remember the Apostle Paul on his... Right at the beginning, he has this incredible encounter on the road to Damascus... And he loses his sight and he, you know, he's to go to the street and God speaks to, was it Ananias? And he's to pray for him. And God told Ananias, he said, there's a man that you're to pray for. He's a chosen vessel of mine. He's going to bear my name before Gentiles, before kings and the children of Israel. And he says, I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. It's part of the calling That's the part we would like to leave out. We want to scratch out that verse. I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. You know, you can choose the easy way. And it might, you might be okay for a time. But you're not going to be okay. Let me tell you. Choose God's way. Whether it's hard or it's easy, it doesn't matter. God's way is the best. God's way is the highest. And often, it is the most difficult of all the ways that you could choose. I mean, if you found that to be true. You know, there are sports that have what they call the degree of difficulty. There's, you know, gymnastics. 
diving, you know, what's that synchronized swimming where these girls do this stuff? It's amazing. Anyway, there are going to be things in life that are too difficult. Check with me this afternoon and I'll tell you about some of the things that are very difficult. Some things you could have, could have avoided. Jesus said, deliver me from temptation. Deliver me not into temptation. But thank God, no temptation, no trial shall overtake you except that it's common to man. What does common to man mean? It means we're all going to face some of the same things. They just come in different packages. And with the temptation, there will be a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Bear it. There's some people facing things this morning. They don't know if they can bear it any longer. Well, you can because the Word says you can. But even if you would doubt, I know a God who can bear it for you. He already has. He bared it on the cross. And you can run to Him. And the things that you cannot handle, God has already handled. How many of you know that's true? He can handle it. He can handle these big, difficult things that come our way. Anybody this morning stretched to the limit? You feel like, man, I've been stretched, I've been pulled, I've been, I'm to the limit. Can we just pray right now? We should just take a time out and pray. Just stand up. You say, I've been stretched. Just stand. If anybody, if, if you want this prayer, we're going to pray that God will give a fresh revelation of who He is and that He will come and lift the burden and break the bonds of doubt and unbelief and anything that the devil wanted you to carry. You know, His yoke is light. His burden. So, Lord, we just right now, we break off the burdens that the enemy would place upon us, the yokes that were not fitted for us nor designed. We break off every heaviness, oppression. And, Lord, where we've been stretched to the limit, God, we thank You. This is difficult. But, God, it's not impossible. And so we thank You we can bear it And God, I thank you that you've already taken it to the cross. And so now we cast it upon you. And we ask for the rest of God, the peace of God. We put on the yoke that you want us to carry that is restful and that is graceful and that will enable us to walk through whatever it is in Jesus' name. So we thank you. We break off the bonds. We break them off. And we loose the people of God. Lord, you said whatever we bind on earth is bound in heaven. So we loose now, we loose the yokes, the shackles, the chains. The, every way that we've been stretched to the limit. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can go ahead and be seated. There's two more things. They went from difficult, then next in verse 9, they go to what's dangerous. Now when much time had been spent and sailing was now danger, dangerous, dangerous. You know, there are many today that are in a place of danger. There are many that are on the verge of getting in danger. What they need is the Holy Spirit, the alarm to go off. You know what I'm talking about when the alarm goes off and you avoid. There's some people you need to avoid. There's some places you need to avoid. There's some things you just need to avoid. Danger. What was that, lost in space? You remember that? Will Robinson had this robot, and he'd go, danger, danger, Will Robinson, danger. We, we need that. We have that. The Holy Spirit, he's better than a robot. The Holy Spirit doesn't get stuck like that guy did. Well, I don't remember his name. Anybody remember? It's a long time ago. He didn't have a name, robot. But the Holy Spirit can tell us, danger, danger, danger. Listen to the dangers. You know what I mean? Listen to the warnings. Listen, it will, it will bear fruit if you listen to the Holy Spirit. He will tell you, don't go there. Now, when you go there, you know, it's not the, you know, the devil wants you to feel like you've blown it all. It's over. You're going to die there. No, there's a place. There's a Redeemer. There's a place. If you confess your sin, He's faithful and just. But it would have been better if you could have just not gone there. You know what I'm talking about? There's some people you just need let the Lord deal with. Just, you know, Lord, just not going to go there. You try to bring them up, they pull you down. 
I wanted Cindy to play Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Because if you know this, how many of you know the story of that song? Isaac Newton. He was a slave trader. He was a disgusting human being. And he would confess this too if he was here today sharing his testimony. He treated, you know, the slaves in some unbelievable, horrendous, inhumane. And, but then after a while he repented. He confessed his sin. He repented. You know, when I was thinking about this, I thought, isn't it just like God? Because if you go back and look at some of the stories, how blacks were treated in those days when they were taken away from their families, brought to many places and sold into slavery, and how horrendous, how horrible. But do you know, those who have been knocked down the furthest are those who can rise up the highest when they get up. And I felt like God was telling me, Listen, they went through those sufferings because of the call of God on their lives at the end of the age. And we need a whole generation in America of black Americans to rise up, shake off the shackles of liberalism, shake off the shackles that men would put upon you, that want to use you for their own political gain, say no to that stuff, and rise up in this hour and be the army of God you've been called to be. I felt some unction on that. I'm telling you, we need black Americans to rise up. Yes, they were treated in the most unbelievable, horrendous, horrible, sinful, disgusting, wretchful ways. But now God will use what the enemy intended for evil for good that many people might be saved. There are young black men that God's going to raise up as mighty, powerful prophets in this hour. Young black women, older black women, God's no respecter of persons. Since there's some juice on that, can we just pray for that? You know, because some people are going to watch. God, we pray for black Americans. We pray. Our, they're not African Americans. They're American Americans. They're our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. There's neither black nor white, male nor female. They're in Christ. They're ours. We stand with them. And we break the yoke of political oppression, lies, schemes, the darkness that would try to keep anyone enslaved to a political machine. And we lose them right now in the name of Jesus this day. And we pray, God, a mighty army would arise. A mighty army would arise. And Lord, thank you. We're a part of this army too. But we need many black Americans to rise up in this hour to confront the darkness in Washington, D.C. And in state capitals all across the land. Not to bow down to the political system, but fear God above every man. And so, Lord, we loose them, we call them forth. A new generation of fire-breathing, young, old, black Americans that proclaim the gospel, the truth. You know what I'm talking about. So, Lord, we thank you. I believe this is real. This, you didn't, Lord, I'm not going to pray something like this unless you put it in me. You can get killed for stuff like this. You know what I mean? So, Lord, we thank you. Who cares if we get killed? God, thank you for what you're going to do. You're going to start a revival in black congregations all over America. All over America. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. And thank you, God, you've forgiven us because we've repented and repented. We've asked for forgiveness. We've had public repentance. We've done this over and we are sorry. But now it's time to rise up and be who you've been called to be. You're not in shackles. You're not in chains. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I like that last verse of Amazing Grace. I was trying to sing it through many dangers. No, that's not the last verse. It's like one of the two or three or four. But through many dangers, toils and snares, I have already come. The grace has brought me safe thus far and grace will lead me home. Thank God for the grace now, we know there are going to be hostilities. We're living in dangerous times. You, you speak God's Word. You try to live righteous in this time. All the hostilities of hell are going to come at your door. But listen, heaven will be found in you in the midst of the hostilities. Let them hate us. Jesus said, if they hated me, guess what? They're going to hate you. Hostilities. Hostile. The world will become more and more hostile. I'm seeing, how many of you are seeing evidence of that? There was a movie about a guy going and shooting up a church. I wonder if that guy that just shot up the church saw that movie. 
And then I saw the other night just a glimpse. There's something else coming out. And it's, a, it's in the cowboy days, and the guy's going in and shooting the people in the church and says, yeah, you want to know Jesus? You want to know suffering? I tell you, this stuff is building right now. There's a persecution rising. This all, this is good stuff. This is not say it's not, well, it's evil, but God's going to use it for good. He's going to have a holy, pure, righteous bride. It probably has something to do with the final purification of the bride of Christ. Because those who can't stand the heat, they'll surrender to the bail of the hour. But those who can will say, I know whom I have believed and I am persuaded. My God is my God. He will save me. And even if He doesn't, I'm not going to bow to you the bail of this hour. You know what I'm talking about? Does that make sense to you? Oh, man. This is so good. God, thank you we get to be here this morning. This is not the same as it used to be. I believe there's a fire burning around this place. All these people God sends. I know some folks don't like some of them. Others you like. I don't know. All I know is I'm the fire I like. So, you know, some of them I said, God, are you sure you're bringing this one, you know? And I didn't know. And you're going to have to pray. We'll have great discernment. But I'm not going to be a lid. No, no. Yes. The Lord told me when I became the pastor, he said, you are a covering, not a lid. Not a lid. You don't shut things off. You might take some gambles sometime. You know what I mean? I don't know. There's no gamble because my sheep hear my voice. So just hear. I hear. I try to hear my voice. God, if I mess up, forgive me. How many of you know He forgives you? We're just men and women here. We're just flesh and blood here. But the Spirit of God is upon us. I showed Shirley this morning the Scripture out of Ezekiel where Ezekiel said, This was after, I think, where he saw the wall, the hole in the wall, and he cleared it away and it became a door, and he was seeing the abominations committed in the house. But anyway, he's, or maybe it was right before. Yeah, somewhere in there. But he said, on this year, on this month, and on this day, the hand of the Lord was upon me. So I just put in the date today. I said, hey, Shirley, wouldn't it be cool if the 17th year of the year of the 20s, And the eleventh month and the nineteenth day, the hand of the Lord God was upon me. So I took a gamble on that. I I just went for it. I just said, God, let it be. His hand's on you. You ought to do that tomorrow. Find that scripture. It's there, I promise you. And tomorrow will be what? 11, 20, 17. Just write it in your journal. On the this year of this month and on this day, I, and then fill in your name, knew by faith and recognized that the hand of God was upon me. And then go out and be what God's called you to be. His hand is on you. His hand's on you. He's with you. And he's going to show himself strong. Well, they went from difficulty to danger. And then you know what was next in this scripture? Impending disaster. Look at this in verse 10. He says, men, I perceive this voyage will end in disaster. They went from difficulty to danger to the impending disaster. You know how the disaster came. Paul, you know, you could tell he had a little bit of flesh left in him because he said, you should have listened to me. I told you, don't go there. You know, you should have listened to me. And you know, the truth is, we should listen to God. America needs to listen to God. We could avoid a lot of stuff if we just listen to God. I know that's not popular anymore to say, listen to God. God you mean God speaks to you? Absolutely, yes, He does. And if you have any questions, just read the Bible. There's plenty of thus saith the Lord's in the Bible. Let me tell you, here's, here's what happens to a people or a nation when they refuse to listen to God. Jeremiah 6, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old paths where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your soul. I mean, that sound good, rest for your soul. But they said, we will not walk in it. Also, I've set watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the trump. I mean, the trumpet. Now, I'm not playing on any words, but I do believe there's something there. There's a final trump to America, a final trumpet. Calling America back to God. Not that He... It's our, our opportunity 
He's providing a way and a time for us to do it. God is speaking to this nation during this reprieve. But they said, we will not listen. Therefore, hear, you nation, America, and hear, O congregation, what is, who is among them. Hear, O earth. So for those who refuse to listen, he says, Behold, I will certainly bring calamity on this people, the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not heeded my words. Ezekiel chapter 3. Then he said, Son of man, go to the house of Israel and speak with my words to them. For you are not sent to a people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language, but to the house of Israel, not to many people of unfamiliar speech and of hard language, whose words you cannot understand. Surely I've sent them to you that they would have listened to you, but the house of Israel will not listen because they will not listen to me. For all the house of Israel, or America, it says, you can put that in there, are impudent and hard-hearted. And behold, I've made you like a strong face against their faces and your forehead strong against their foreheads. And basically, he just goes on and says, you tell them what I'm saying, whether they will listen or not. Because that's not your problem, whether they listen, you tell them. And then the key was in there, he said, Then the Spirit of the Lord lifted me up, and I heard behind me a great thunderous voice and the glory of the Lord, from the glory of the Lord in that place. And then Jesus, remember what he said in John 8, Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. And you know why? He just told it like it was. Jesus said, You're of your father the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer. He was an abortionist from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resource, for he's a liar and the father of it. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. And then he goes on and talks about he is of God, hears my words. How many of you had a teacher when you were in school that came along and, you know, grabbed your ears, sque- squeezed your ears? Oh, you had a mom that did that. Did she shake your ears too? Oh, you're homeschooled, yeah. Anybody have a teacher that would squeeze your ears? I did. Nobody else? Maybe I'm the only one that did stupid stuff. But they would come. This lady, she would squeeze my ears. And when she shook them, that's serious. The the squeezing's bad. The shaking's really bad. You know what I mean? No wonder I can't hear sometimes. The lady, the teacher, it's her fault. She did that all the time. You, 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 well, not all the time, Shirley. I did listen sometimes in class. But I tell you what we need. We need God to shake our ears. We need Him to shake the ears of, our, of America. Because He loves us. Because He loves us. The teacher just wanted me to listen. I'm going to need that math class later down the road. You know what I mean? You're going to need that English class. You're going to need that knowledge. We need God to come. And uh, he wants to do that. It, but they were on the edge of an impending disaster. Well, how does this story wrap up? I'm, I'm just going to wrap it up now. There's, you can read it. They go from difficulty to danger to on the edge of a great disaster. In fact, in verse 20, you can see that. Now, when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, no small tempest beat on us, all hope that we would be saved, was finally given up. I wonder how many, and I know there are many people in churches, they've almost given up. Well, obviously by the song we sung this morning, we've not given up. But America is on the verge of an impending disaster. I don't care what anybody tells me. The wages of sin is death. God's not whatsoever a nation reaps that it will also, our soul, that it will also reap, right? And we saw a few weeks ago, hey, Brian, there are reaper angels. They're, they're gatherers, harvesters. Before there's going to be a great ingathering, there's going to be a great outgathering because the outgathering angels are going to gather those who were, they were lawless and they offended and God will gather them out. But there's going to be a great ingathering. Does all that make sense? That's kind of where we've been, looking at all this stuff in the Scripture. But God wants to shake America. He wants to awaken America. He wants to awaken. The great shaking is for a great awakening. 
So what's the help? What's the hope? All lost is hope. You could go in that camp and you could stop right there and close the book. Well, all hope that we would be saved is lost. However, that's not how the story ends. How many of you are glad for that? So there's difficulty, there's danger, the threat of impending disaster. And then what happens? Anybody want to take a shot at it? There's divine intervention. All of a sudden, Paul has an encounter with heaven. There they are. They, they didn't listen to him. They're facing this unbelievable Category 5 storm. It looks like they're throwing off some of the tackle that's on board. They're ready to go down. The ship is about to sink. And then Paul says in verse 22, we'll get beyond verse 21. He first got a little shot in there and said, guys, you should have listened to me. But then after that, and now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. There's going to be some destruction of the ship, for there stood, look what he says, by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, do not be afraid, Paul. For you must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who will sail with you. Therefore, take heart. Paul had an encounter with God. An angel showed up in his room. And he assured him, listen, I know it's difficult. I know it's dangerous. I know disaster. It looks really bad. Imminent disaster. But there's a divine purpose, a divine intervention. Heaven has come. And things are about to change, Paul. So you go tell them. You speak, thus saith the Lord, to those that have given up hope. And I'm going to reveal hope because I've got a divine plan. And my plan will not be stopped. And God's got a plan for America. He's got a plan for this. There's a great harvest right now that's right now on the brink. And I tell you, there is hope. There is, thus saith the Lord. America can be saved if we hear what God says. Even in the impending disaster. Divine intervention. And that's the only hope for America. Divine intervention. It ain't going to happen because a president... You know what I mean. It ain't going to happen because a senator wins or loses. It's going to happen because a people prayed. They sought his face. They turned from their wicked ways. They prayed. They called on him. And God came. And heaven broke out in the midst of earth. Amen. Does that make sense?